series, it, it folds into the broader series that is being done in, on Sunday morning, et, et, et cetera, uh, involving the kingdom. And my part of that on Wednesday nights will be dealing with Jesus' parables about the kingdom. So it's a two-part thing. We're going to be looking at Jesus' parables, and we're going to specifically being, be focusing on Jesus' parables about the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Sound okay? All right. That will give us plenty to do uh, because there are at least 13 of those. just kind of depends on how you count parable. Before we do that, though, we have a need to get on the playing board. And Jesus' life and ministry and the way that Jesus contextualized his message to a specific people in a specific area in a specific language, um, it's, it happens on a real playing board. And I've said before in this pulpit, and I'll say it again, that it's real hard to play Monopoly without the board and so it's really good to go and get on the playing board of the land of the Bible in order to understand the Bible. That makes sense, doesn't it? All right. Uh, another thing that, uh, that this accomplishes, and this is just kind of an almost accidental thing is that, uh, that happens, is once we get into the real world of the boots on the ground, the, where the rubber meets the road, the nuts and bolts of the world of the Bible, we all of a sudden realize that the Bible is not a book of fairy tales. It's not a book of legends or myths or any such thing. And the reason that we can do this, we can test this scientifically, is we can compare what is being said in the Bible to what we have in geographical terms, in archaeological terms, in ancient literature outside the Bible. And there's, so there's standards of measurement here that then in a certain way, and I'm going to use this term in, 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 a, uh, in a very loose way, we can rescue the Bible from the world of myth, legend, fairy tale, bedtime story, etc., and realize that Jesus is a real person speaking communicating to real people in real time and space. So let's take a look at the um, land of Israel, kind of big picture. This is a uh, layer-tended satellite, and uh, you see in front of you the Mediterranean coastline. This is the western edge of Israel. You can see big bodies of water like the Dead Sea and like also the Sea of Galilee, connected by the Jordan River, whose channel you can see right there. This little eye here, that's Jerusalem, and if you go about five miles north, that begins Samaria, or what today is called the West Bank, and that goes all the way to a huge broad valley called the Jezreel Valley, this area here. Here's the, the Nazareth Ridge where Jesus' hometown Nazareth is, and so we're going to just track a little bit uh, from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee in the next slide. And I've marked that spot. This is Nazareth, and this is the way that Jesus would have traveled when he moved, Matthew chapter 4, from Nazareth to Capernaum. And what I want to do is I want to take a look at some places around the Sea of Galilee because all in this area on the northern shore, the highlands around the northern shore is where Jesus conducted the vast majority of his ministry. And most of his ministry, the, a lion's share of that ministry, is uh, accomplished via the vehicle of parable. And so let's take a look at uh, straight up and down. Now this is an aerial view. Again, Sea of Galilee. This is the southern tip. This is the northern tip. This is west. So if we're here... Um, we, uh, at Magdala, where Mary Magdalene is from, we're about 500, 550 miles, um, 5,000, 5,500 miles away from where you're sitting right now. So just imagine, teleport, transport yourself uh, from, uh, from where your seat is, 5,500 miles east of here, and you're right there where the cursor is pointed. So we're going to take a look at Magdala, We'll look at Capernaum, where Jesus' base of ministry was for his three, three-and-a-half-year ministry. We'll also look at Bethsaida, where uh, at least four of Jesus' disciples, Peter, Andrew, Philip, and Nathaniel, were from, and presumably more. Um, it's a great, great question to ask, why would a carpenter choose fishermen? You know, usually birds of a feather flock together, um, but not with Jesus. Um, he's choosing fishermen. 
There's an article out there that you're welcome to read. It's online. It's free. It's written by me, um, uh, unfortunately, but you'll get through it. You'll make it. What doesn't kill you makes you weirder or stronger or something like that. All right. So Bethsaida, and then we'll also look across the sea at Gadara or Gergasa, um, Gerasa, depending on which manuscript, uh, Greek manuscript of the New Testament that you are looking at. So let's look first at Magdala. Um, you guys up in the booth, you're going to have to take control, but we're on the top of Mount Arbel. Mount Arbel uh, is about uh, 600 feet above sea level, but then since the Sea of Galilee is sitting so low, 696 below feet below sea level, you're going to get to the the, the, the precipice, the edge of this mountain, and you will be dropping off some 1,300 feet, a little over four football fields in drop-off. Okay, this tree is where I like, like this group that's there now. I like to gang my folks up there because there's usually a little bit of shade, and you come onto the plain of Gennesaret, all right, the plain of Gennesaret. Je Jesus healed a person that touched the hem of his garment here. Uh, Jesus also preached a sermon from a boat here just off the shore of the Sea of Galilee there. And uh, toward the end of this uh, video, well, right off the edge, is where the city of Magdala was discovered but totally by accident uh, by bulldozers in 2009. It's been uh, largely excavated now. There's still some excavations going on. But then if you continue, uh, from Nazareth to here is 20 miles. So if you're at Magdala, another five miles around on the north shore, you're going to get to Capernaum. It's in the haze in this particular picture. We'll get better uh, optics in just a moment. But just think of Jesus stops here, visits with Mary Magdalene, with her family, with friends that he's made there, preaches in one of the at least two synagogues that have been discovered there since 2009 and um, moves on then five more miles along the shoreline to Capernaum where he moves in with Peter, Andrew, and their extended families at Capernaum. A little two more, a little bit more than two miles further to the east, and you come to Bethsaida. Let not your heart be troubled. We're going to go there next. Go ahead, guys. So now we are at Capernaum, and these are the, we're on the, we're on the, uh, shoreline, the northern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, and looking up into the hills where Jesus taught, maybe gave the Sermon on the Mount, gave the Beatitudes and the like. Uh, this is uh, Capernaum coming up here. looking straight north from the edge of the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful country, yes? It's, in other words, you would like to go there. Just reading between the lines here. North shore of the Sea of Galilee right here. This is a retreat center that's been built on the northern shore. It's a place that you might want to uh, go and uh, spend some time in study, prayer, meditation. This is the Church of the Twelve Apostles. It's a Greek Orthodox church. And then right beside it, the property of the Roman Catholics begins. So Franciscan um, archaeologists, excavators have excavated underneath this modern church. Here is the home of Peter and Andrew. The synagogue is here. It's only partially excavated, but you can see the shoreline again right below you. And this is now a redirection, and we're looking to the south. Sea of Galilee, the southern end, the northern end. We were at the plain of Gennesaret over here just a moment ago at Magdala. Uh, this was the hill, Mount Arbel, that we bailed off of in our drone in order to see the plain of Gennesaret. Again, there's the modern church. Underneath is the home of Peter and Andrew. The synagogue, um, whose at least its base, its foundation, is probably first century. You'll see it here in just a second. It's a different color. 
It's the dark color there, different colored um, rock, stone. And then from, uh, this, from this view, we begin to move eventually toward the east, move from the west here eastward this way, and we'll take a look at Bethsaida next. So Magdala, Capernaum, Bethsaida, you know these names, right? These are places you probably also want to visit. I'm just guessing. Just trying to read between your, the lines. Okay, so Capernaum. Let's roll another one. Let's go to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is two miles east of Capernaum. So you have Capernaum here down by the seashore, kind of right in the middle of the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And then two miles to the east, following along the shoreline, you come to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. This is the northeastern corner here. You can begin to see the Jordan River. That's the northern or upper Jordan River that flows into the Sea of Galilee, providing the majority of its water. What I'd like you to focus on is this patch of trees right here. A few years ago, uh, at the suggestion of one of our mentors, Dr. Mendel Noon, who's since passed away, there's the Jordan River right there, the mighty Jordan, right? Flows right past this, uh, this grove of trees here. And so you have uh, the, uh, the excavation going on of biblical period Bethsaida. It's again, Jordan River snaking around here. And... This area here is where Gadara is, or Gergasa, or Gerasa, depending on the manuscript that you read. All right, very good. Thanks, guys. You can turn that off, and I'll take back control, because I'm sort of a control freak. You could tell. All right. This session tonight is on the parables of Jesus, and it's a, it's a flyover. It sets the table for what we're going to do in the next five sessions where we take at least one, sometimes up to three or four parables in a given evening talking about the kingdom of God or kingdom of the heavens. So we want to do some survey stuff tonight. I want you to be able to, to really dig in and understand parable like you never have before. It's one of Jesus' most vivid means of communication. And so when, we, when we're looking at parable, we're looking at Jesus at his best. We're looking at Jesus at, his, at, his, at, his, at one of his greatest attempts to connect with the common person, with the average Joe. And so everything that we can learn about parable and then pay that forward when we're looking at Jesus' kingdom parables, that's going to put us in a position to better understand Jesus. Jesus is a, a, a Jewish man who grew up raised by Jewish parents in a Jewish home within a Jewish community with Jewish neighborhoods and he's reading and writing in Hebrew and learning to speak in Hebrew and all of this is happening in the land of Israel and so keep please keep reminding yourself of that that Jesus is not a short-nosed blue-eyed blonde-haired tall um, guy from the Midwest from Iowa for example um, Jesus is going to reflect the realities of his world and when we get in to start getting in touch with that world, then we start better understanding what Jesus is saying. When we start better understanding what Jesus is saying, we start better understanding Jesus himself. Then the, the, there's more stuff on the inside of us that the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to use to transform us more carefully into his image, which is the ultimate goal, right? All right, so Jesus' parables... How many parables did Jesus create and deliver? We don't know because we weren't there and we don't have them all. But what we do have is somewhere between 42 to somewhere over 70 plus parables. And um, if, if that's only a portion of what he told, and we're pretty sure that that we only have a portion. Mark says, for example, and with many other such parables did Jesus teach the people. So we're told in the New Testament itself, hey, there's more. There's more, y'all. So 
42 to 70 plus and maybe even, you know, north of 100 parables. Jesus is constantly churning, generating these parables. It's not a time where he's quoting the Hebrew Bible or what we call the Old Testament. This is something that he is generating and he's creating. So this is a major driving force of the revelation that he brings. This is, this is an important teaching tool for him. As much as anything else and more so, he's using parable. In the Gospel of Matthew, you get about 24. In Mark, you get seven, the fewest. In the Gospel of Luke, you get 28, which is amazing, really interesting because he's the only Gentile author of Scripture, both old and new, and he's giving us the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, but he gives us more parables than anybody else. The Gospel of John contains no parables. He's not telling us what Jesus told in the term of parable. His stuff is more like simile, you know, like I am the door, I am the, the good shepherd, etc. He's really not a door. He's really not a shepherd. He's a carpenter, but he's using these as similes. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's go with the d definition of parable. We know the word. You hear the word all the time, especially if you're a believer, you've hung around church and stuff. You hear about parable really early on, right? Another indicator that this is a major um, means by which Jesus communicates truth. But the question really is, other than a weird-sounding word, because we don't use it in everyday English, we don't use it over the water cooler or, you know, when we're camping out or, you know, playing ball, hunting, whatever, we, we don't usually use the word parable. That's the reason why we need to dig down into the background of parable. A par and sometimes it's, it's, it's easier at least to start by describing or defining what parable is not. So it's not a simile. It's not like brave as a lion, strong as a horse. It, it's not that. So it's not a, a parable is not a simile. It's also not a fable. You've heard of Aesop's fables. Um, in Aesop's fables, you get, for example, animals doing things that only human beings can do. For example, in Aesop's fables, you'll hear about uh, animals sowing seed and growing a crop and reaping a harvest and then grinding grain and then baking bread. That, that's make-believe. Animals don't do that, at least the ones that I've seen so far. Uh, so it's, this is not a fable like Aesop's fables. Uh, it's also not a legend. A legend is something that has a kernel of truth about an individual or an event or whatever, and then it begins to grow and get bigger and more fantastic to the point where you've got this guy who can, you know, like, you know, shoot an apple in half, and there's even a Disney movie made about him, Robin Hood, right? Uh, he's kind of a composite character. We don't, can't really ground and root a whole lot of what goes on uh, in, in the story of Robin Hood uh, in historical, archaeological, factual, geographical reality. So uh, parable is not legend. Uh, parable is also not fairy tale. Fairy tale is just make-believe from the get-go. It doesn't even have a, a kernel or a nucleus of reality that something then else grows around until it gets to be a full-blown uh, legend. Fairy tale is make-believe from the jump. And uh, so parable is not that either. Um, Lastly, par parable is not allegory, and an allegory is an extended story in which every component part has some sort of a secret or mystical or symbolic meaning um, that then kind of comes together, and we're supposed to be able to put all the component parts together. Everything has a symbolic uh, meaning, and parable is not allegory. We'll go into more of this as we move on. The original languages, we get the word parable showing up in Jesus' Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament. The word is mashal, and mashal can be translated in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes it's translated riddle, but, but it's not that. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's difficult to... It, to describe from the Old Testament side because Old Testament parables really aren't all that much like New Testament parables. I don't know if you've noticed that before, but feel free to do your own study. You'll come to that conclusion is that, yeah, the same word is being used, 
So you get the word mashal in the Old Testament. You get the word mashal also used by the rabbis from the time of Jesus. But they don't, they're not exactly meaning 100% the same thing. It's something that is of illustrative value. It illustrates. Um, it's kind of a word picture of one reality or another. It's, it's used to, uh, to, to give an example, to, to illustrate a reality. The Greek parabole is where we get our word parable. But the word para means beside or up against or next to. And boleo, it means to throw. So, so to throw something up against something. It's almost like the language of comparison. This is like that. This has similarities to that. So parabole, it's a word that shows up in Greek and it ends up being the word that the Greek writers of the New Testament used to describe these kinds of stories that Jesus told. Uh, in, if, here's a way that a lot of people today describe the, the word parable. They'll look it up on the internet. And what you do is what you, what you find if you just type in a, a, a simple Google search, definition of parable, this is what you get. A simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. About the only thing that's any good on that uh, definition is something told by Jesus in the Gospels. The rest of the stuff doesn't really fit. So I would encourage you, note to self, don't use Google necessarily to define biblical words. Let bi the Bible define its own terms. It, it doesn't make any more sense than looking it up in, in Webster's Dictionary. News flash. Jesus didn't have Webster's Dictionary to refer to, nor did any of the 40-plus authors of the Bible. So that's... You got to wait until you get to the 1800s or so before you before Webster becomes helpful in defining English words in ways that are helpful and meaningful. So uh, forget about Google. Google's not going to help you that much. But similarly, scholarship is not going to be all that helpful. C. H. Dodd, an eminent, preeminent New Testament scholar wrote a book called The Parables of the Kingdom, which you would think, wow, I bet you that's one that Dr. Nunley's got on his, you know, right at the, the, the front of his table to study this series on kingdom parables. But the reality of it is that Dodd and I are not exactly on the same page. C.H. Dodd says that a parable leaves the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application. In other words, you don't know any more about what Jesus intends when you've, after you've heard the parable than you do when he starts. So that's not going to be helpful that much in a, in a kind of a, a genre, a type of literature whose goal is to help you get on board with a spiritual truth that Jesus is trying to uh, communicate. So we have to have mark off a lot of New Testament scholarship. Parables in, let me just suggest that if we let the Bible define its own terms, we're just looking at a word like parabole, parable, mashal in Hebrew. Um, it, it, we, we get the raw data out of the book where that word is actually being used. Does that make more sense? Isn't that more organic? Doesn't that make more sense to get closer to the origin of the stuff? So let's let the Bible define, and I'm going to sum it up here, and that is, a, a parable as Jesus uses it, as it shows up in the New Testament, also as it shows up in those early rabbis from around the time of Jesus, is a snapshot of everyday life. A snapshot of everyday life. It's something that is so common, something that, that is such a paradigm, so, so stereotypical of life that everybody can get on board with it. You can be literate, you can be illiterate, you can be in the king's palace, or you can be um, someone who's just trying to make ends meet and live day to day. Anywhere in between, man, woman, Pharisee, Sadducee, follower of Jesus, not follower of Jesus, and, and you can get on board with this because Jesus is ripping a page out of the newspaper of his world, of his day, of his lifetime. People then understand what Jesus is saying. They get it because they're part of that same world. They're living these same realities that Jesus is living every day of their lives. They share these, this common culture 
common points of, of contact with the reality of their world. And so Jesus uses that. It's a snapshot of everyday life that is used then, this level on this physical plane, our world, to illustrate spiritual realities. That's a simple enough concept, isn't it? Using what lies close at hand, everyday world, everybody gets it, to what is going on that is of a spiritual nature. In other words, using something concrete from our world to define or describe something that may not be quite so con concrete, not, not so everyday, not something that you can always see with your eyes and feel with your fingers. Jesus' parables. Are, are Jesus' parables unique? Is he the only one that's ever made up this approached teaching with this kind of um, literary context or form or style? And the answer is no. There are at, at least a, over a half a dozen that we can identify from the Old Testament. Feel free to take a picture with your cell phone. You can look these up later and decide whether, yeah, that fits, that doesn't fit. Or these are like Jesus' parables or not like Jesus' parables. Feel free. It's not copyrighted. They're just Bible verses. So, yeah, there's, there, there are antecedents. There are things that are going on before Jesus comes on the scene. And these are part of his Bible. So is he reading this? Absolutely. Does he know it by heart? More than likely. Um, but he is influenced then by what he reads and what he has accepted as being divinely inspired scripture. And it's all over the place. It's in the historical books. It's in the, uh, the prophetic literature, et cetera. It's kind of all over the place in, uh, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. But it's not just way back when that, par that we get parable. There are parables that are being told in Jesus' world all the time by the early rabbis, by people that are training, teaching disciples before the time of Jesus and during the time of Jesus' ministry and then directly after Jesus' ministry. So I'm not talking about a rabbi down the street who wrote a book. I'm talking about the ancient rabbis, the ancient leadership of um, uh, the Jewish population in the land of Israel in the first century B.C., first century A.D., etc. And they are voluminous. I mean, it's not a half a dozen or so like we get in the Old Testament. Parable has exploded. It has become an incredibly uh, important, um, constantly used tool for interpreting the Bible and for communicating the message of the Bible to the common person. In fact, we have more than 2,000 of those parables from the ancient rabbis that have been preserved for us in what is called rabbinic literature, the, the material that it gener was generated by these early rabbis and eventually written down, which we have available to us. And it's online and it's free. And most of it's even in English. Isn't that cool? Receive it. Not like they do on Christian TV. <laughs> All right. There's some interesting things about these about these parables, though, because you have in rabbinic literature, you have stuff from rabbis in Babylon, stuff from uh, rabbis in Persia, uh, stuff from rabbis in the land of Israel. But those people that generate parable are only from the land of Israel. The Babylonian rabbis, the Persian rabbis, those guys are not creating parable. So this is a uniquely land of Israel, Hebrew language Jewish leadership that we call rabbis, those are the only kinds of people that are producing parable. What does that tell you about Jesus? Does that conform to the evidence? Jesus is from the land of Israel. That's what the New Testament says. Jesus is speaking in Hebrew. There's a word in Hebrew it says 16 times in our New Testament. And yeah, he's communicating to people in the land of Israel. Fits perfectly. Makes perfect sense. The parables of these rabbis are often introduced with certain formulas. You know, like we have a formula that starts a, a bedtime story, once upon a time, right? Okay, that's a formula. That's an introductory formula. So formulas like, to what may this or that be compared? A parable. 
to what this may be compared. These kinds of comparative sort of, uh, sort of introductory formulas. You've got that in the works of the rabbis. You also have that in the New Testament, and we'll see that as we study these parables. So the formulas are very similar. It's not something that these guys made up later. It's not like Rudolf Bultmann says that, well, the early church just made up all the words of Jesus, 88, 80-something percent um, of the words of Jesus. No, they, they don't make up formulas that look exactly like rabbinic literature and their formulas for the introducing of a parable. All of these parables, they function the way that Jesus' parables function. They are... Uh, using a snapshot of everyday life to illustrate the meaning of a Bible verse and used to clarify that Bible verse's application to everyday life. So the function, the way that parables are functioning in this world, whether it's Jesus or his contemporaries in the world of the rabbis, this is all going on on the same track. And these parables are closer to anything else that we have from any other ancient literature or whatever. I have a, a friend who's retired now and uh, taught at a state school near me, and uh, he wrote a book um, in which he was trying to illuminate, explain the parables of Jesus in light of Aesop's fables. Didn't work so well. I have another friend, and he wrote a book using African folklore to try to explain the parables of Jesus. That didn't work so well either. The closest that we've got is stuff that's going on right in the land of Israel, right under Jesus' nose, and is being um, used quite often by his contemporaries as well as rabbis before and after him. Okay, how do parables work? Parables are always used in a teaching context. They're used as a means of communicating a master's intentions to a student. They're used to illustrate a spiritual reality. Everyone's got to be able to understand what's going on. There's not any secrets, no cards being held underneath the table. This is not just for the intellectual elite. Everybody's got to get this or the stuff is not used as a parable. It's like, oh, that didn't work. We're not using that one again, that kind of thing. And parables typically have one primary focus, one thrust, one major objective, trying to get one spin, not a multitude of like allegory where every component part of the story has to mean something unique, something special. So let's do a study real quick. You guys have heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Most everybody's heard the parable. It's in Luke chapter 10. And... It's one of the better-known parables of Jesus. It's not a kingdom parable unless you stretch it to say, you know what, people who say that they are members of this kingdom ought to be acting like this. I can stretch it and get there if you want. Um, but if you'll allow me, I'm going to use this because we do know it, quote, so well. Or do we? Starts out with a question. Almost always starts out. If, if these kinds of conversations always lead in with a question. You may notice this when you're reading your Bible in the future. Behold, a certain lawyer, meaning an expert in Jewish law, stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, instead of saying, Well, here's the list. Just go and check them off. You know, check the boxes. Jesus said, What do you think? He said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? This is so standard in not just the New Testament, but in the works of the early rabbis. And it's even standard in modern Israel. In today's news, there was an opposition leader who was questioning Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of uh, Israel. He said, will the hostages return home? Netanyahu's response is, are they home now? You respond to a question with a question. You've heard that before, but now you're seeing it in real time. So now here comes Bible content. A question is raised, and in this world, everything revolves around the Bible. Sorry, guys, if you don't have Bible, you can't play. You got to have your pu puzzle pieces. You got to have your, 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 your chessboard parts you, to, to play the game. And so here you got to play the game. So the man answers Jesus, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all of your mind. And your neighbor is yourself. And taken for granted is, and you shall. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He weds these two together because a great uh, uh, rabbi, his name is Hillel, Hillel the elder had already connected these dots. These are the two most important, and everything else in the Torah is just commentary, um, uh, kind of expanding on this, th- these, these most important principles. If you love God, you ought to be loving your neighbor. The application Jesus brings, Jesus said to him, you answered correctly, do this and you'll live. But then there's a question for clarification. Wait a minute, I have a follow-up question, sir. You know, like in an interview, uh, in a Q&A with the president or whatever. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, how far does my responsibility to love neighbor extend? Who is my neighbor? So Jesus then gives a parable to clarify the Bible passage. Love God, love neighbor. How's that supposed to look in real time? Here comes the parable, a snapshot of everyday life that is describing a spiritual responsibility or reality. Jesus said, there's a certain man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among robbers, stripped him and beat him, and he went off um, and went off leaving him half dead. Josephus, first century Jewish historian who was born and raised in the land of Israel, says at this time, all of Judea was overrun by robbers. Same Greek word. Lestes, or in Hebrew, lestim. Judea was overrun by robbers. So this is a reality that everybody knew about. It's not something that's a surprise to anybody. Oh, really? You mean we've got robbers among them? They're all over the place. And in the wilderness between Jerusalem and Jericho, they're especially dangerous. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road, leaving Jerusalem, going to Jericho, when he saw him and passed by on the other side. Similarly, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, non-Jewish, living north of Jerusalem, that five miles all the way to the Jezreel Valley, who was on a journey, came and said, And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine in them. And he put him on his own beast and he brought him to an inn. Remember that this is a parable. It's a story. It's a stereotypical snapshot of everyday life. And he took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii. This is a two days wage worth of uh, money, earnings. And he gave him to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I return, I'll repay you. Now, Jesus applies what the person has just learned via this parable. Jesus says to the expert in Jewish law, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to be the man who fell into the robber's hands? And the man said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Now you've seen it, and you, you've seen like an HD video, a, a, a 4K video of your life, your world. And do, you, do you get this? And the guy goes away. Did he get it? We don't know. So what we tried to do was try to put that in the context of first century Judaism. Compare that to what some of the early church fathers were doing, second century, third, fourth, fifth century, into the 4th and beginning of the, of the 5th century A.D., St. Augustine was typical of the early leadership of the church that had moved away from Judaism, moved away from connection with the land of Israel, and he was actually a Neoplatonist. What do you mean by that? He actually was very heavily influenced by another Jewish author named Philo of Alexandria who followed the allegorical method. Remember what allegory is. Every little bit and piece has got to mean something. Each part becomes a a, a symbolic of a greater reality. No interest in historical context, no interest interest in what the author originally intended to be understood as saying. So, St. Augustine. Augustine says, when he reads the parable of the Good Samaritan, when it reads a certain man, the word man, uh, aner or uh, adam in Hebrew, that's got to refer to Adam. 
And so it was going down. Well, that then obviously means that he fell. He fell from grace. He sinned in the Garden of Eden. He fell among thieves. Well, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan is the thief. And so that has to be the symbolic meaning of that part of the parable. The Samaritan felt compassion. Well, Jesus is the one who feels compassion. So the Samaritan has to represent Jesus in this story. And then he brought him to an inn. Well, he brought him into the church and gave them to, gave the two denarii to the innkeeper. Well, the innkeeper must refer to Paul because to Paul had been given charge over all of the, had responsibility for all the churches. This is allegory at its weirdest. Okay? This is the kind of stuff that we engage in in the church today. We are not exempt. We are Augustine. Christian television, Christian radio is St. Augustine of Hippo. That's fine. We can go with that if we want to, but we'll never get to the intended meaning that Jesus had for this parable. And that is, which one proved to be neighbor? The one who showed mercy. Then you go and do the same. That's how you show your love for God, by showing your love for neighbor. And love for neighbor includes everybody. It's not just the Jewish folks. It's not just the folks living in the land of Judea. It's, it includes even the people that we hate, love the least, which would be the Samaritan. Now, parable, do they clarify the message of Jesus or do, do they confuse the message of Jesus? Again, back to C.H. Dodd, leaves the mind in sufficient doubt. Is that Jesus' purpose, is to leave us in doubt, to stir up our minds, but never give us anything concrete enough to hang our hat on? Well, in the Gospel of Mark, we're told that, um, that Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm speaking to them in parables, in order that while seeing, they may not perceive, in hearing, they may not understand, lest they turn and be forgiven. That almost sounds like God's right. But if you read the parallel in the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, look at it, it says very clearly, so I speak to them in parables. Why? Because they're not seeing and they're not hearing and understanding. In other words, I'm trying to illuminate spiritual truth, not hide it. I'm trying to demystify it rather than cause people to stretch without ever quite coming to reality. And in fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's in Mark and Luke too, we find this statement, the chief priests and the Pharisees, and we think those guys were the worst of the worst. They least understood Jesus. They were the ones who, who persecuted him. They were the ones who were primarily responsible for uh, put, uh, getting him in, in trouble with the Romans and insisting that he put, be, be put to death. Really? Is that right? Because in this text we read, those guys heard his parables and they understood them. They got the point. They knew that he was speaking about them. Better believe they understood what, the, what Jesus was saying. It's a very pointed message. At this point in the story, Jesus was pointing his finger at them. You're the ones not getting it. So can Jesus' parables be understood? You better believe they can. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole point. My question is, like these leaders who didn't want to see what Jesus was pointing out. Are we missing it because of? Now fill in the blank. Just think, go into your own party in your own mind just for a second. Are we deflecting? Are we ignoring? Are we pretending we just don't get it because we don't want to get it? Jesus' parables demand things like loving people you don't really like and don't want to love and don't want to have anything to do with, like forgiving. Huh? Like being merciful as he's merciful. The kingdom is, is like this. And if we want to be members of the kingdom, the, we, we got to own up to that level of, of responsibility. You, you, you see what I'm saying? The whole purpose of Jesus' parable telling is not to cloud reality, but to clarify reality. I want to encourage you as you read your Bible. I want to encourage, encourage you as this um, series plays its way out. Let him clarify pastor. Father, in Jesus' name, we just want to ask you that 
you would use this introductory, this flyover, and that you would use these future sessions, these next five, as we look very carefully at what you in the flesh had to say in time and space, in reality, in such a powerful way to impact people for the kingdom. We ask for your touch and your spirit's help as we pursue you through what you said. And we know that you're serious about this and we want to open up and give you free reign in our hearts that you work and you tinker and you clarify. Lord, you, you reset all of our gauges and that you challenge our socks off to follow after you wholly when you, we see you as clearly as we're going to see you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.